Assalamu alaikum, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to the webinar and uh, our very, very important discussion today around higher education governance. And we're running this webinar as part of our higher education program in Uzbekistan. And we are delighted to run this program in close collaboration with the Ministry of Higher and Secondary Specialized Education of Uzbekistan, Higher Education Council, El Yurtomide Foundation, and with big support of Uzbek Embassy in London. Today, we have got 182 uh, participants uh, to, uh, to represent rectors, pro-rectors of universities, uh, wider academic leadership, members of national and international education reform projects, and wider higher education network that we work here in Uzbekistan with. And we are delighted that on this project, we work in close collaboration and partnership with the company from the UK called Advance AT, one of the leading educa higher education institutions in the United Kingdom. And without further ado, I would like to ask Deputy Minister of Higher Education, Uzakboy Shoim College Begim Kulov, to say a few words to welcome participants and to outline key priorities for universities today. Over to you, Uzakboy. Assalamu alaikum, Ramatli Ellison Jones, Honam Victoria Holbrook, Rachel Island Honam, Jamle Gulamova. Uktam Pardayevich va hurmatli bugungi tadbir ishtirokchilari, ruxsatlaringiz bilan men avvalon bir so'zimni boshida mana shunday dolzar mavzuda, ya'ni oliy ta'limni samarali boshqarish uchun sharoit yaratish mavzusida webinar tashkil qilgan demak Britaniya kengashiga, Advanced Teach tashkilotiga vazirlik nomidan minnatdorchilik bildiraman. Qolaversa bugun kunda O'zbekiston oliy ta'lim tizimida muhtaram prezidentimiz rahbarligida amalga oshilayotgan ishlar, demak, o'zini samarasini berib, bugun kunda O'zbekiston oliy ta'lim tizimi dunyoda o'zining nufuziga, o'zining e'tirofiga ega bo'lmoqda. Bu jarayonlarda biz Britaniya kengashi bilan yaqindan qilinayotgan hamkorlikni alohida e'tirof etish maqsadiga muvofiq. Bugun kunda Britaniya kengashi O'zbekistonda olib borayotgan oliy ta'lim dasturlari O'zbekistondagi oliy ta'lim tizimini 2030-yilgacha bo'lgan rivojlantirish konsepsiyasi va bu bolada olib borilayotgan strategik vazifalarga to'liq mos keladi hamda uzoq muddatli barqarorlik yo'lida ikki tomonlama sherikni ikkita mustahkamlaydi. Institutsional va milliy darajadagi aloqalarni kuchaytiradi va diversifikatsiya qiladi. Bugun kunda Britaniya kengashi Oliy o'rta maxsusning vazirligi bilan hamkorlikda oliy ta'limni keng ko'lamli isloh qilish, salohiyatini oshirish va bayonal millatlashtirish maqsadlarini ilgari surish maqsadida oliy ta'lim va ishga taqsimlash dasturini amalga oshirmoqda. Ushbu dastur milliy oliy ta'lim islohotlarini qo'llab-quvvatlash uchun yetakchi oliy ta'lim muassasalari va sifatni ta'minlash agentliklari bilan hamkorlikni kuchaytirishga qaratilgan. Advance H Buyuk Britaniyaning loyiha bo'yicha hamkori ikkita asosiy tarkibiy qismlarga egadir. Huquqiy me'yori va ta'lim isloh qilish siyosati va oliy ta'lim sifatini ta'minlash, ma'lumotlar bazasini boshqarish va keng ko'lamli transformatsiya dasturlarini ishlab chiqish va menejment sohalarida vazirliklarga bilim almashish va maslahat berish, ularga xalqaro munozaralarda O'zbekiston Respublikasi va Oliy o'rta maxsusi vazirligi va boshqa manfaatdor tomonlarning mas'ul maxsus konsultatsiyalar va binalarda ishtirok etish orqali amalga oshirib kelmoqda. Bugun kunda samarali boshqaruv jarayoni tomonlar uchun kerakli ishonchni va dastakni yaratadi, chunki tashkilot kerakli darajadagi maqsadlarga erishishni ta'minlash kerak. Tobora kengayib borayotgan boshqarish nafaqat moliyaviy barqarorlik va me'yoriy hujjatlar muvofiqligi, keng ma'noda qiymat yaratish bilan ham uzviy bog'liq. Shuning uchun bugun kunda 
Mana şu, bir tane kengaşı bilen amal kuşlatken işler bugün kunda alay tarım tizimde aldı durgan dozlar vazifalarını amal kuşlaşka hizmet kıladı. Hürmetli Ancuman iştirakçıları, man bugün kunda mana şu, bir tane kengaşı edmeyiz içi kampanyası bilen amal kuşlatken faaliyette kuyudaki sırlarına Allah'a da yetibar kadar çizgi sorardım. Bu birinci nabatta alay başlıştı. Yitakçı üniversitelerinin tecrübelerini king organiz. Bunda harici mütakasilerinin iştirakını king getirir. İkinci, bugün kunda alı talim muhasseleri ortası da biz tanla velon kılgamız bu beşte yitakçı alı talim muhasselesini tanla o asası tanla balıp onların harici hamkorları bilen birgelikte transformasiya kılış layıkasını amal kavuşturmak için. Bana şu cerdanları da ham bir vasıta yukarıdaki taşkıratlarını hamkorluğu muhumu ve oranın egeleyi de bu liman. Yana bir muhum masala bu, hamkorlu klinikten alay talim masalarını da təşkil etirgen fan ve inovasiyalarını ameliyatka cari etişte, ticaretleştiriş bulunmalarını, faaliyetini təkamülüştürüşke ham alakı da etibar kadar çizarır. Şunun dek, bugün kunda Britanik İngaş ve Edvenski etçi kampanyalarını, imkaniyetlerden faydalanıp, hoşma malak aşırış kurslarını yolga koyuş ve bir vasıta bu kurslarda rahbar ve pedagog kadrlarını malak aşırışını aşırışını ham üstü vazifat sıfatı bilgiler için mümkün. Çünkündük, bugün kunda mehnat pazarı talepleri ortaya tıkan vaxtıda bitiruçlarının kasbi terliyeliği derecesini monitoringi namalga aşırış. Halkara miyarlardan kelip çıkıp bakalış tizimini cari etmiş ham maksat gamalı. Dünyadaki haberleriz var. Bu yıl uçta alı talim muhasasamız demek e, maliyavi ve akademik müstakillik verilip onlar bana şu müstakillik şarayeti de faaliyetlerini alıp varadı. Bana şimdi de şarayeti de bir vasıta yetekçi harici alı talim muhasasalarına aynı kısa Büyük Britanya'nın üniversitelerinin tecrübesini nabetke olgan kaldı. Bana şu da bizim de maliyavi ve akademik müstakillikte uçetken alı talim muhasasalarımız faaliyetini Demek ki, her tamallama maslahatlar bir şarkalı kullanıp kuvvetleşini demek ki rövajlandırış maksatı mağaf deyip sorduyum ben. Şunun için Respublikamızda Britanya King Aştaman'dan ki tamallama şirikli asasında alet talim çizimini rövajlandırış yönelişlerdeki hamkorlukta amalga aşırı etken işlerini kullanıp kuvvetleyimiz maskul yönelişte hamkorluk için minnettarçılık bildirim ben. İtibarlarınız için rahmat. Dr. Rahmat, uh, Dr. Begimkulov, many thanks, uh, Dr. Begimkulov, for outlining key priorities for higher education uh, today and uh, kind of strategic directions for our further discussions and our further work as part of this and many other projects. And as I mentioned before, uh, on this program, we also work with Higher Education Council here in Uzbekistan. And I'm delighted to ask uh, the chairperson of uh, uh, Republican Higher Education Council, Oktam Pardevich Umirzakov, to say a few words. Over to you. Katar Ahmad, Assalamu Alaikum, Hurmatli. Tadbir iştirakçıları, aziz hamkasplar, hanımlar ve canablar. Hazır gün amana uzak payıke hançelik bu dozartlı dozar bugünkü uçuraşımız doğrusu da gəpirdiler. Respublikamızdaki ıslahatlar doğrusu da gəpirdiler. Albatta bunu haytarmaslıkka harakat kılgın xalda benim az günü bir 2-3 minutlik uzumu fikirlerim var. Bugün kunda ali talim tızımını Modernizasiya qilish, ilm fanini rivojlantirish, o'qitishning zamonaviy shakl va texnologiyalarini joriy etish bo'yicha respublikamizda keng ko'lamli ishlar olib borilmoqda. Buni hamma yoki ich bo'lmasa ko'pchilik yaxshi bilib turibdi. Xususan, oliy ta'limni samarali boshqarish maqsadida yaratilayotgan shart-sharoitlarning barchasi xorijiy oliy ta'lim muassasalari bilan hamkorlikda talimini keng islah kılış, salakiyatını aşırış ve halkarala şu faaliyatını yana da keng getiriş sohamızın en dozlar masallardan biri bolib kalmaqda. Ali talimin asasi vazifası her bir insanın bugünkü tez özgür uçan mihnet bazarıda münasib oranını topışı. Rövajlanıp barayetken inovasyon muhtikar ularını maslaşı uçanlığını 
təminləş və şüngə zəmin yaratış, həm də ümumən cəmiyyət faramuallıqını təminləş imkaniyyatını birədəgən yuqarı mələkəli və əməli konikmaqə əgə bölgən qədrlərini təyərləşdən ibarətdir. Aynən, bugünkü əncümənliyin Ali Təlimli Samarəli başqarış üçün şərait yaratış deyib namlanışı xəm becizəməz. Çünki Respublika Ali Təlim tizimini xalqara təlim standartları bilən uyğunləşdiriş, ilğar xarici təcrübəni çıxır orqanış və təxlil qılış əsasıdır. Təlim dasturlarını cəxəngə tən alıngən xalqara standartlar tələbləri gə maslaşdırış bugünkü künnin üstüvar vazifələrdən biri olub olmaqda. Bunu mənə xəbərləriyiz var, hürmətli prezidentimiz tamamdan 2019-ci il 18-ci aktəbərdə təsdiqləngən Özbekistan Respublikası Ali Təlim tizimini 2030-ci il gəçə bölgən davrdə rövajləndiriş konsepsiyası. Mən diyərli xər bir sözümün çıxışı da aynən şü konsepsiyası gə konsepsiyaga demək ki, əslərdə diqqətləriyizdə yana-yana bar qaytarmaq çıb olayıb mən. Şunun də, Vazlar Baxkəməsinin 2020-ci il 27-ci aktəbərdə Ali Təlim masasaları, nüfuzli xarici Ali Təlim masasaları bilən xamqarlıqda transformasiya qılış çörə tədbirləri torusudəki qararı və 2019-ci il, bu niyəm əlbəttə istəşimiz gərək, 11-ci iyuldə Ali və orta maqs təlim soxası da başqarını ıslaq qılış çörə tədbirləri torusudəki qararları əsası da əməlgə aşırətkə ıslaqatlarını tüzətişimiz mümkün. Şü bilən bir gəlikdə, Britaniya kengəşinin Uzbekistanda alıb bariyyətkən Ali təlim dəsturu əməlkətimizdəki təlim ıslaqatları gə qoluq maskələr institusional dərəcədəki əlaqələrini küşə etirib gəlməkdir. Üçbu yönəliş Britaniya kengəşinin təşəbbüsü bilən əməlgə aşırılayət gəm bolu. Bunun əsasi məqsədi Ali təlimini rövajləndiriş və bitiruçilərini iş bilən təminləşki kumakləşiş dəsturunu muvaffəqiyyətli əməlgə aşırışdır. Üçbu dəsturunun özüqə xasılıqı milli Ali təlim ıslahatlarını qolla xüvatləşdə yetəkçi xarici Ali təlim muhasasalardəki təlimdə sifatını təminləş və o zara xamkarlıqını küşəyətirişkə əlaqıda əxəmiyyət verilməkdə. Şunu əlaqıda yenə təkitləş gərək ki, institusional dərəcədə Britaniya kengəşi komagədəki Uzbekistandəki bir qatar nofilagəki Ali təlim muhasasalardə qədrlər salaxiyyətini aşırış, təlim sifatını yaxşıraş, dərs veriş metodologiyasını təkəməlləşdiriş, və ingiliz tilidəki ədəbiyyatlar bilən təminləş qəbi yönəlişlərdəki halqara layıqalarının icabi nəticələri yaq qol qorunub barmaqdır. Respublikamızda təlim soxasıdəki ıslahatlar bugünkü kündə özünün dozərdləgi həm də əmali əxəmiyyəti bilən başqa soxalardəki ıslahatlardan asla qalışmaydı desə balaqa bölməydi. Şü bayız, Ali təlim müəssəsələrini Samarəli başqarış üçün şərait yaratışdə başqarı cərayanını mənfaatdar tamamlar üçün muxum dəstək vəcifəsini bacarıb gəlməkdir. Topora keyn qoləmdə işlətilib kələyətkən başqarış nə pəqət maliyyəvi barqararlıq və miyari xücətlər muhafıqlıqı, bəlkə keyn manada bu torusdə mənə hürmətli profesor Bəyin Qolubam aytdilər, Ali təlim müəssəsələrə maliyyəvi və akademik erkinliklərini birli çıxam, təlim tızımını yəngi basqışını bilgiləydi desəm xam, doğru bolədi. Əmin mən ki, bundəy platformalarda təşkil etiriyyətkən mülaqatlar və xəmdə xalqara təcrübə əlməşublər əmləkətimizdən Ali təlimli başqarış imkaniyyətlərdən yenə də səmərəli rəq faydalanış. Respublikamız Ali təlim tızımını Dünya Ali Təlim tizimi gə integralləşuvunu cədələşdirişkə icabi kursatədə deyib ümid qılamad. Sözümü yakunu da bugünkü tədbir əsasi təşəbbüskarı bulgən xamqarımız Britaniya kengəşi gə özümü namımdan xəmdə qob sonli Ali Təlim masasaları 
rahbarları namıdan çukur müne darçılıgımla bildiremem ve neticede yöneltirilgen hamkarlıgımız uzak yıllar devam etedir degen ümit tamam. Etibarları için katta rahbar. Uh, many thanks, Oktam Pardaric, for your warm welcome and for your views on uh, key priorities for education reform in Uzbekistan and what it is that we need to focus on. Thank you very much. And now I'm delighted to introduce Alison Jones and Vicky Holbrook to uh, to run the second part of our webinar. And before we started, I ask all of you to leave any comments or questions in the chat. And we will deal with those questions and comments in the end of the presentation by Alison and Vicky. So over to you, Alison and Vicky. Thank you very much, Jamilia. Good afternoon, Salam Malikam. It's wonderful to be joining you today. Listening to uh, Mr. Uktam Mazakov, he mentioned the rapidity at which you had been implementing your higher education reforms. And I really would like to congratulate you on the speed of the transformation I have already seen as an external observer. I first came to Uzbekistan in January 2019, and Jamilia and I had been talking about work to be done and to support uh, you uh, before that in 2018. And in three short years, I have to say, you have made huge advances um, in terms of your ambitions uh, for higher education. So you really are to be congratulated on that. And it's a real privilege for us to be working alongside you as, as you make those choices and you make those changes. Uh, we have now had a series of these uh, seminars with you over the last 18 months or so, and we have covered subjects such as quality assurance, data, regulation, large scale strategic change, and today it's the turn of governance. And I would like to just begin before I introduce my colleague, uh, Vicky Holbrook, who will give you the, the case study experience of the UK here for you to draw which bits appeal to you would make sense in your context. I would just like to briefly um, set out the meta context for governance in an autonomous higher education system. And I'm delighted to hear about the autonomy, um, which is now um, spreading through the higher education system in Uzbekistan. I'm presenting this as, a, as an idea that effective governance is actually a virtuous circle. The key to governance, um, we believe, is the assurance that it provides. So starting at the top of this picture, effective governance provides assurance to your stakeholders, whether it's government, students, uh, your Ministry for Finance, employers, uh, the research community, it provides assurance that your university is well led, well managed, well governed. And that's the notion of providing confidence and also trust in the system. That assurance then leads on to people feeling comfortable with the idea that universities are autonomous they can be freed up because the assurance, provi the, the assurance of governance provides confidence in the system. That autonomy, of course, when universities are freed up and the, the talent within is unleashed, that autonomy creates innovation. The innovation I've just heard Uktam talking about and Uzik Boy talking about in terms of what will transform your country and, and deliver on your ambitions for change. And when people see that innovation, that again provides assurance. It provides assurance through the innovation. It reinforces the insurance of governance and the virtuous circle of assurance, promoting autonomy, autonomy, promoting innovation, the innovation promoting uh, assurance is what I describe as the virtuous circle. So I 
what I'd like to do now is just to leave that thought with you. Um, you may agree, you may disagree, you may be curious, um, but we can pick this up later on. I'd like to now hand across to my colleague, Vicky Holbrook, who is the senior lead at Advance HE for all of our work in governance, who will unpack the role of governance and particularly assurance and how it's operated in two different ways in the United Kingdom. So you can see two systems and, um, and then make your own minds up about what's right for you. Thank you very much. Vicky, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alison. I'm really pleased to be here with you today. Um, my name is Victoria Holbrook. Um, I am the Assistant Director for Governance at Advance HE. And our organisation as Advance HE, we train nearly 1,000 governors of higher education institutions every year. We conduct reviews of effectiveness at universities and we share practice and we lead change projects in the sector. So we have a huge amount of insight into how governance works in practice in higher education. My background is as a senior public servant working for the government agencies in higher education. In England, I worked on a range of funding and policy and regulatory matters. And I experienced the change between regulatory systems in England firsthand. So the system up to 2018 and the system since then. And I will draw on that today. I'm also a member of a governing body at a university. So I also have that insight to bring. So I've been asked to talk about uh, university governance and I'm going to take a systems approach here. So what are we going to do today? What can an HE higher education governance system look like? What levers can different parts of the system use to drive progress and change? And what do we know about the good features of practice in English higher education? As Alison said, I'll be drawing on that English experience because there has been so much change. There's an opportunity to take some reflections from that. But I'm not recommending how things should be done in Uzbekistan. It really is for you to decide what's most appropriate for your operating context. My slides contain quite a lot of text in English. I won't be talking to all of it but the slides will be translated and circulated to you afterwards. So to recap, we understand that your higher education strategy comprises a range of things from autonomy, as we've heard about already. You want to increase participation in higher education, achieve research potential, improve the student experience, improve better industry and employer links, etc. And you want to enhance society in Uzbekistan. I'm going to concentrate on two aspects of that today, autonomy and an increase in participation. But everything that we cover will have implications for the whole of your strategy. I know that you have talked a bit about this before, but as Uzbekistan develops its system to, uh, to higher education, it has some choices to make about how it exercises powers and where and how different parts of the system work together. And I'll illustrate some of this as we go through. So there are hard aspects of higher education regulation and there are softer aspects the transactional or the strategic, where you fake focus on compliance or where you might focus on good practice. But there's also an important dimension, which is about how the system regulates itself and the ways in which you work in partnership. And I know that that's something that you're exploring at the moment. So as we begin, I wanted to take a moment to remind ourselves about the purpose of governance. And as Alison described, it's about providing confidence and clarity 
for all your stakeholders. But it's also about making sure that organisations and systems deliver what they are meant to deliver, whether that is financially sustainable institutions, student outcomes, the delivery of strategy and achieve performance measures. But we often focus on the second aspect about delivery and forget about it's about providing confidence and clarity. And we mustn't lose sight of that. Confidence and clarity means people, investors, governments, partners trust you and are more likely to work with you. When we look across the world and other sectors such as banking, corporate, even charities, there are a real number of themes that are emerging in the academic discourse as well as practice. This is about how institutions are governing themselves and how stakeholders want their institutions to be governed. The first of these is transparency. Transparency of how decisions are made and by whom. The second is impact. Clarity around what difference we're making and the outcomes that we want to achieve. Evidence, decisions being made on strong evidence and thoughtful approaches to risk. Social responsibility, so playing a role in the world beyond financial contribution. And voices, giving stakeholders, including users, more say in what happens and how things are done. So we need to hold that in mind as we go through. The landscape of governance is evolving and those are some of the themes. So what and who makes up a systems approach to governance? It's always a balance between government, the sector itself and individual institutions. And this comprises both formal and informal elements of governance. And by that, I mean some of it is prescribed and written down, codified in law or regulation or codes of practice. And some of it is more about collaboration, action, culture, the way in which we work with one another. There are a large number of roles to consider as part of a system of governance in higher education. We'll now have a look at a couple of these and how they've used different leader, levers to uh, realise some strategic goals. And I'm going to do this in the context of England prior to 2018 and afterwards. So this is a simplified version of what the higher education system looked like in England. The red labels of government, funding council, access body, and quality agency, they are the formal government structures that were in England before 2018. The purple labels here make up the different layers of governance within an institution. You have the governing body, so at the very top, we have the leadership um, team, and we have an academic governance system of committees and other bodies who oversee how education and research is delivered. The key lever at this time that government had to create change was funding. It wasn't a very highly regulated approach in England at this time. The system operated with a very high degree of autonomy given to providers. If the government wanted to create change, it would generally use its funding powers through the funding council to elicit that change by funding new initiatives and by placing controls on the system in different ways. Note that there is a line here between the funding council and the advancement body. So the government was keen to fund and support the development of practice and people 
in support of its aims and objectives and to contribute to an overall healthy system. On the other hand, at the bottom here, the quality agency, there is a line between the quality agency and the institution, but it perhaps didn't operate at a much higher level within the system. And it might have been focused very much on process rather than outcomes. We'll return to the role of the vice chancellor's group and the chair's group later. But note that over here on the right, students feel set apart from the system in any formal sense. So who was doing what to ensure that HE participation increased and that education was of good quality in this environment? I'm going to draw out just a few key points and you will have these translated slides afterwards. As I've said, funding was the main lever. It was used by government either to increase or decrease student numbers through caps on how many places the government would fund. They would fund programmes such as outreach into the regions or communities with low participation rates. And they would develop practice such as in learning and teaching. They might use funding to try new types of courses or subjects and incentivize providers to do new things. The other feature was regular inspection by the quality agency and by the funding council for the overall approach to governance at an institution. But these were fairly formulaic and they were process driven. Reports delivered action plans, but there were very little sanctions or implications. Within the institutions itself, so this top label is about the governing body of an institution. Governance regarding quality of the student experience was largely left as a managerial task within the committees and structures of the institution. The governing body did not play a very active role in education matters, but would focus on strategy, growth, financial resilience, and league table performance was often a key measure of success. Students as stakeholders in governance and being able to add value to how their student experience could be improved was an emerging theme but it wasn't front and center, and it certainly wasn't incentivized by the system. So overall, highly autonomous institutions, they could get on with things, they could keep their funders happy relatively easily with very little interference from government. The incentive to drive up participation and quality relied heavily on values here, it relied on the values of the leadership team. It, value, it relied on the values of the governing body and where they chose to focus their attention. So I'm now going to talk a little bit about what's happened since 2018. What has changed and why? Broadly, England has one of the most expensive higher education systems in the world. Government believed that institutions were receiving too much public money for not enough accountability. Particularly, they grew concerned about the quality of teaching and outcomes being fair for all students. And they also thought that progress was not being made quickly enough on social mobility. So a focus on not just getting students into higher education, but what did they go on to do? What value was higher education really providing to students and the taxpayer? These, that's a very difficult question to answer. And actually, we can all think of a range of factors that go beyond the control of an individual institution. However, this created the political case for change and a new regulatory system came into being in 2018. So the key aspect of this is that 
the main lever in the system is no longer money. It's regulation and the ability to comply with the conditions set by a regulator. But importantly, that regulator takes a risk-based approach. So it doesn't have inspection on a regular basis, but only when the regulator thinks necessary. And crucially for institutions, the expectations of the regulator are more explicit and place much more onus on the institution's governance at the highest level to be assured about quality and standards as much as financial sustainability. So the stars here represent what has changed. Thunder to regulator, students at the heart of things and the primacy of institutional governance. But another key element is that the regulator does not really see a role for itself in advancing practice or developing the system, particularly for teaching and learning or leadership capability. It sees those as matters for institutions who are part of a market who might wish to compete with one another. And it sees those as part of ongoing continuous improvement that institutions should take responsibility for. The only area where it provides additional support to institutions is around access and participation. And that is because that is such a key aim of the government's strategy in England, is how to drive up social mobility. Again, there's lots of detail here, but I will highlight a few key points. The primacy of the conditions of registration for driving practice, particularly for access and participation, where targets are set and where plans have to be agreed with the regulator. But as I said before, it's risk-based um, regulation. So the regulator will only intervene where providers may be uh, causing concern. Maybe their data shows some problems or they pick up some challenges in other ways. But where this has arguably made the biggest difference is the approach to governance within the institution, particularly as it relates to student numbers and quality of, in, of education. So the clear regulatory expectations mean governing bodies have to know more, they have to understand more, and it's their assurance that matters to the regulator. So this means that governing bodies have to understand how academic assurance functions within their university. They might need to understand how different sorts of students have different sorts of outcomes and why that might be. They might engage directly with students and they have a broad conceptual of risk beyond financial. But the burden of compliance in this approach is higher. So that places extra burden upon the secretariat of universities. More evidence is sought and more is needed. Institutions have to be very clear about how decisions are made and why. However, students as stakeholders in government are much more front and centre now. Their value is recognised about how they can shape their own education experience and shape it for the students who come behind them. That's also translating to other sorts of stakeholders within the institution, such as the staff voice and also employers. So what does this comparison between the old system and the new system tell us? Clearly different actors in the system can use different sorts of levers, but incentives need to be used carefully. There are advantages and disadvantages to both approaches and it is still too early to tell in England which bears the greatest results. I wanted, though, to talk about the role of sector self-regulation and sector-led enhancement. 
So clearly the relationship between the regulator and institutions themselves is very important, but other organisations can play important roles. In England, there are three key groups. So there is the chairs group, the committee of university chairs. They develop and issue voluntary codes of conduct on institutional governance. And adherence to those can be used as evidence to submit to the regulator that you're meeting your conditions. The vice chancellors group provides a forum for university leaders to have a shared voice or to take forward initiatives in their own right. And they also lobby government and the regulator. And the advancement body, which is Advance HE, provides services to enhance practice and accredit success, giving the sector confidence in what it's doing and recognition for key achievements. And it responds to the needs identified by its members who are the universities. So having a regulatory system of regulator and institutions, but these sector level organizations as well, adds up to quite a powerful system of checks and balances and the way in which the sector governs itself. I'm going to talk briefly about university level governance and effectiveness. In England, it is these factors which make up a university's governance. You have the institution's constitution, how it's set out that it needs to be organized the regulatory requirements, the voluntary code that it would subscribe to. And as I mentioned just now, that's by the Committee for University Chairs and culture. And actually, that's probably the most important part here is the culture. So why is culture so important to governance? because it looks beyond the processes and the structures. Although they remain really important, culture considers the ways of doing things that mean that results will really be achieved. It's about collegiality, but also about professionalism. Much research has been undertaken about how boards work, how strategy is delivered. The key thing that people come back to is strategy. And this famous phrase, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Meaning if you don't understand your, your culture and it's not conducive to delivering your goals, your strategy won't exist for long. So what are the things that make up culture in this context of governance? It's trust among one another, transparency, healthy challenge, respect, diversity of perspectives, permission to take risks and learn from that, agility, and being focused on continuous improvement. So our governors as individuals and as a collective need to operate with these qualities in mind for governance to be truly effective. Diversity of perspective is one of the key things we're working on in higher education. Who gets a seat at the table matters and it matters to building trust and confidence with your stakeholders. More than that though, there's emerging really strong evidence in the corporate sector that diverse boards and leadership lead to better performing organizations. So if we're serious about equality in society and social mobility, then we need to ensure that that reaches into our governance systems at all levels. And if there's an opportunity to strengthen that, it should be taken. And the UK is still very much on a journey in this respect. So the gender balance on boards in UK higher education is 41% female, but that's in a context of the staff population in UK higher education being over 50% female. And there is even more work to do for others 
such as black or minority ethnic people. But this isn't about numbers. It's about avoiding groupthink. So different perspectives help solve problems. A range of lived experiences informing and testing plans help shape strategy. And it gives you a closer and more representative link to your stakeholders. There are a range of levers that we can use. And these are all in experimentation phase, I would say, in the UK. There isn't a, a golden model of how to do this that includes quotas or targets. It includes frameworks for how you recruit leaders and governors. It includes development programs for how you train people so that they understand the governance role that they need to take or are prepared for it. And it includes sharing practice. At Advance HE, as I said earlier, we go into universities on a regular basis to evaluate their effectiveness. And we have a framework which captures quite a lot of the things I've described today. It's based on research and the themes that I identified earlier at the session, and it helps us understand how far governance is delivering against those two key tests of purpose, confidence and trust, as well as delivering the outcomes that you should be. And while university governance in the UK is generally well developed, it's still adapting to shifts in the regulatory and operating environment. So effectiveness needs to be tested regularly to ensure continuous improvement. And that's important because our regulatory and operating environments change all of the time. So there is no one fixed way in which governance should operate. It needs to adapt to suit the circumstances. And that's why checking it is, is very important. When we analyse the work that we do with institutions, we find that there are some persistent issues. These are around diversity. They're around induction and how well prepared governors are to take on the role. It's around their confidence often to assure academic matters because they may not feel very close to them. And it's around clarity of what is being measured and how performance can be assessed. So even while higher education in, in the UK and its governance is well developed, there is still a need for continuous improvement. We also find that universities tend to rate themselves better than our judgment might rate them. So having checks and balances is a good thing and it's our job to hold the mirror up from time to time. And having a healthy governance system is one where that mirror is held up from time to time. I'm stopping here. I've noted some references, but I hope that's been a useful, if quick, exploration of governance systems at work to deliver strategy and the roles that different actors can play and some of the choices that we have. Thank you very much. Many thanks, uh, Alison and Victoria, for a very useful um, uh, presentation and overview of what is being done uh, in the area of higher education mm -hmm. governance. I have got several questions um, and people are texting me directly. And one of them is um, in view of what you have uh, explained in terms of changes and challenges that higher education institutions face at the moment, what are leadership skills that are required? So what would you say are priorities in terms of skills development uh, for academic leaders uh, today and tomorrow? Do you want me to go first, Vicky? Okay. Yes, please, Alison. <laughs> uh, that's a very good question. And 
I, I do think the pandemic has also brought to the surface uh, leadership skills, which were always necessary, but I think there are some that are more necessary in the environment in which we are now operating. I've always noticed uh, one of the, the biggest challenges I face as a chief executive in an organization, which is small compared to a university, is my role is very much one of balance, balancing the numerous demands which are placed on the institution, the various ways my staff prefer to go about doing things because all human beings bring different gifts and talents and abilities. So it's a constant balancing act. And I think the ability to be able to balance the variety of pressures on resources, the variety of tensions that the leader faces has become more and more apparent and more and more important. The second area I would say is trust. Uh, we're still very much operating um, in a Zoom culture. We are not back in the workplace yet, although I think you're in a better position than we are. However, when we move into autonomy and we let go of the controls, which we often would have seen as a hindrance in the past, we need to have the courage to trust people. And that's also an issue which has come to the fore in terms of how we operate in a post-pandemic world. And the third thing I would say is being comfortable with uncertainty and ambiguity. That was important before, but what I've seen through the pandemic, and I have chaired numerous global and international panels with vice chancellors talking about this, the planning horizons, particularly over the last year, have shortened, um, some to as little as monthly planning sessions, then moving to quarterly planning sessions, just in order to secure financial sustainability. So I was talking to the rector and chief executive of the Aga Khan University, which also runs a huge hospital system as well. Their planning, their planning horizons were down to a monthly planning cycle, moving to quarterly. And I think as you enter into more autonomous higher education system, which um, creates more of a, a market in higher education competition, um, I think you need to think carefully about how far you want to go in terms of competition, in what time scale, because that brings a whole range of demands on institutional leadership where the infrastructure may not be in place. I think I'll finish there, but I'm happy to say more if needed later. Thank you, Alison. Vicky, anything to add? Yes, um, from a governance perspective, so if we think about the role that a governing body has within the institution, there's always a boundary between governance and management. And what we have seen, I think, through the pandemic is that that boundary has become more blurred, actually, because yeah. the challenges of running the institution and the decisions that needed to be made very quickly that were of a significant impact required much closer working. So the ability for governing bodies with executive teams to have a really healthy working relationship, and that does come back to that trust and collegiality, a respectful working relationship where at times of need, you can actually really work together, still providing challenge, still providing oversight, but actually enabling your executive by working with them really well and drawing on the fantastic experience that no doubt will be part of your governing body. So I think something about the boundary between governance and management that needs to flex to suit the circumstances and the challenges that you face. But beyond that, I would also say it's heightened the focus on who is on the governing body and what skills and capabilities do they bring? Do they really understand higher education and what it is like today? Do they bring find really good skills around innovation and capacity building? Might they have additional human resources 
leadership skills that can be drawn upon when things are challenging within institutions. So the skills that are around the table, the people that make it up have also become really important and heightened as being of importance, I think, in recent months. Thank you very much, Vicky. Uh, so the next question is actually linked to the first one, and that is um, around professional development. And the question is, what are, um, you know, uh, whether there are international networks where Uzbekistan academics uh, uh, can join in order to take part in the international discussion around modern governance and challenges um, yeah. and solutions? Um, so <laughs> the, the trouble with higher education is there are so many networks. We, we are very good at creating special interest networks. The one that immediately springs to mind for governments, um, for members of institutions, is a network called Humane, which is, um, I forget what it stands for. It's, I think it's, it, it basically, it's, it's the international European network for higher education, heads of university administration, and university secretaries, those who are responsible for the governance within the institution. And that's one that immediately occurs to me. That is based, as I understand it, on institutional membership. And um, it's easy to Google them. I think in terms of other governance networks, our committee of university chairs, which is for the chairs of governing bodies only, um, it's very much a UK based uh, network. I don't know, Vicky, if you know of any others. No, it's a really good question, but we, I think that isn't anything beyond humane that would be especially helpful for you. And that's often because governance is quite highly contextually driven in terms of the systems and processes. Um, so I would suggest that, and I'm sure we can find a link for you um, and share that with Jamilia. And if we think of anything else, we will also share that with Jamilia. Thank you very much. And um, the next question is in the chat, and that is how universities respond to new challenges and how they nurture a new generation of young people able to contribute to success of their countries. Um, I'll start off and I know Vicky will follow on. I think how universities respond to challenges. And for us, the, the, the, the challenge that universities face in the UK is um, that the tensions between being a global operator operating nationally within the UK and then supporting their region. Um, the way that they will do this is through the autonomy that they have, which is built into our system. So it's for the leadership team to do their horizon scanning, to look at their strengths and weaknesses as an institution, look at the opportunities and threats in the external environment, and from that to develop their strategy. This is where the governing body has a key important role in the UK because it's a key responsibility of the governing body to shape and give direction to that strategy. So um, how institutions respond to that, that, those challenges and the success of that is down to the senior leadership team. So those strategic thinking, strategic analytical skills are absolutely core and essential. And of course, the difference between leadership and management is that element of judgment, which is doing the right thing, whereas management is doing things right. Now, a leader has to be able to do both, but the most important thing from the leader point of view is to do the right thing, and it's to exercise that judgment. Um, as, you, as you're aware, um, I think it's the autonomy that's helped the UK to become a world-class higher education system over a period of time. 
And, you know, we have invested very heavily in our leadership development. Advance HE runs the top management program for higher education, which is about developing the next generation of university vice chancellors. We also run one now in Australia and New Zealand, and we do have international attendees coming onto this program. So there needs to be a long-term investment um, in that leadership capability building. Um, and universities invest heavily in the development of their people. And of course, we have the national infrastructure in advance HG to support that. I don't know if you want to add, Vicky, anything to that, because there, we also need to develop our governors, don't we? We do. Yes, thank you, Alison. A few points. Um, Alison's talked about strategy and doing the right thing and having that choice is really important. So it's quite tempting, I think, for institutions in the UK to want to respond to uh, the latest government direction or to chase um, some available funding in order to develop a new initiative. But actually where we see things really leading to success is where institutions make those choices based firmly and grounded in, is this right for us as an institution? Can we do this in a sustainable way? Does it relate to our values? Does it relate to who we are as an institution? why students come to us, why partners work with us. So having that clear sense of why we're doing things is really important. I wanted to talk about the question um, that I think was raised around um, responding and developing different types of students. The UK has moved from a position of thinking about we need to get more students into higher education to a position of thinking about what are the different sorts of students we need to come into higher education and how do we support them to succeed so that their background doesn't determine how um, whether they are successful or not. So that's a bit of a shift that's happened and it's happened in policy terms as well. So one of the key things institutions need to do is recognise quite simply that all students are different. They will have different lived experiences, family backgrounds, um, different educational starts, and institutions need to be prepared to recognise that and to work with students to develop them and enable them to be the best that they can be. That might mean they have to offer extracurricular opportunities to develop their confidence, to, um, to provide them with work experience, to provide them with opportunities to get involved in student life in different ways. But that real and relentless focus on understanding that there is a breadth of student needs is really important and how your institution responds to that is really key to ensuring that a whole different group of students then go through to be successful and they become the leaders of the future. So you have a diverse talent pool that you work with all the way through. Um, I would also say in higher education in the UK, our governing bodies are made up on average of about half of those appointed being independent. So from outside of the university and from outside of higher education, they might come from corporate backgrounds, from charity backgrounds, um, from other sorts of um, industry. And they may not know higher education. They may not know the current challenges the institution faces. And it is, the, it is really a job for all of us to help support those people to get up to speed and to use their skills in the most appropriate way. So at Advance HE, we run quite a lot of development programs for new governors, um, which supports them to do that. Thank you very much, uh, Alison and Vicky. And then the next question is, please tell us how institutional quality and efficiency is determined and is there a controlling body that does this? Okay. Um, 
I'll start again. Um, and, and, and, and Vicky, I know, will add to this. Uh, so we do have the Quality Assurance Agency, which sets out um, guidance and requirements around standards, academic standards. Uh, as Vicky said, um, we've moved away from routine inspection to much more around um, self-regulated and self-managed reporting. Their role has reduced um, over time but they will um, assess quality against a broad framework. In terms of efficiency, um, pre-2018, the funding body would fund efficiency initiatives and drives, which were um, basically based in good practice sharing, good practice development, um, with uh, built into that funding, met, systems to cascade the learning throughout um, the higher education sector. And there could well have been um, financial levers to support this, i.e. funding attached to greater efficiencies. However, that, that approach to funding um, gradually reduced over time because it was found to be excessively burdensome. But as a principle, um, when funding levers were used, they were used to initiate a change in behaviour until that behaviour was embedded in good practice. And then that funding um, um, requirement to that, that funding lever would be removed. So, for example, we sponsored um, a massive change in the development of human resource management. So there was a time about 20 years ago where universities didn't have human resource management strategies. And the funder invested a huge amount, millions of pounds, to assist universities to develop a human resource management strategy. And after five or six years, that funding gradually reduced and reduced and then eventually stopped as institutions had their HR strategies in place, which were working. And then it was up to them to maintain and keep the good practice moving. Um, similar exercise happened with efficiencies. Nowadays, um, in a higher education system, which is regulated as much by the competitions regulator as it is by the higher education regulator, the belief is that, that efficiency will be driven out by the market. So the market will lead to greater efficiency, full stop. Vicky, I don't know if you want to add anything further. I think your final point there was really important and and I would absolutely stress that the shift in policy in the UK does mean that competition between providers is seen as a key mechanism of driving up efficiency and quality. Um, that's not to say that it always works and indeed institutions are not very happy about this. But it is seen as one of the key mechanisms for driving up quality and efficiency. And so there is far less government intervention in those mm. spaces than there has been in the past. And that does mean less funding as well. I, I would like to add, though, our current, our, our current government is struggling with the challenge of how they're going to deal with the increasing demand for higher education by students in this country. And we are a very expensive higher education system to run and they are facing a dilemma of not being able to afford the numbers of students who want to come into university. So they have two ways of tackling this. They will either cut the amount of funding they give to universities per student, or um, they are thinking about a policy of tackling what they call low quality courses. Now, our government has a tendency to think that low quality courses include things like media studies, perhaps some of the arts subjects, and they are thinking about uh, developing metrics to identify what is a low quality course or degree. The, their thinking is the metric they would use and attach to this would be how much graduate income will a student earn when they complete this degree and then setting a level of graduate income as the expectation for any degree. 
now there are arguments against this because students who study social care um, degrees who perhaps become social workers or care workers um, when they start those kinds of jobs attract much lower salaries um, and so there is a social impact in terms of um, what students either will wish to study or it may well impact on the supply of well-qualified well-skilled people to do some of the jobs which would not normally attract the the mean the average level salary so as you can see we're experimenting with new measures to assess and control quality very much market-based um, the jury is still out on whether this works or not the quality assurance agency which continues to exist does minimal quality assurance work um, so we are we are in the middle of an experiment i would say at the moment so keep watching um, and, and be absolutely clear to make your own decisions about which way you go. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alison. Um, uh, next question is about administrative autonomy and is it as important as other aspects of autonomy? So what do you say? Um, uh, <laughs> I think I understand the question. Um, so let me just say administrative aut autonomy is exactly the same as university autonomy. So the university is completely autonomous in all of its affairs, whether that's finance, human resources, uh, student admissions, uh, the quality of their degrees, the, the, the, the standard of degree that, degree that they award, um, the delivery of their research, they run their own ethics committees. So they have complete autonomy, including on the administration. It's not just academic autonomy. Thank you, Alison. I think that that's a very important point. It Vicky, is very Alice, important. yeah. Uh, Vicky, do, do you have anything to add to this? No, not to that one. It is, it is absolutely as Alison has described. Yeah, so next question is about um, training university authorities um, uh, on university governance. And uh, I'll probably say that the British Council is now developing a global, uh, going global higher education partnership program. And as part of this, of course, we will be looking at uh, a number of strategic aspects of higher education development and governance will be uh, definitely one of them and we will be uh, engaging all our partners in Uzbekistan in uh, um, high level discussions and training programs when the program is developed. But maybe to ask you, Alison and Vicky, what it is um, you know, uh, in the UK that is offered now uh, to university governors, governors, um, rectors, vice chancellors in this area. I'm happy Vicky, this to. This is definitely one for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'm very happy to. So this is interesting because it's not mandated. So this is all entirely voluntary and it's not government funded. It is entirely funded by the university themselves or even the individual themselves if they so wish to. So I'll talk about members of the governing body. So the way that that happens is our organization, Advance HE, um, runs training programs for governors throughout the year. So that will be induction to higher education governance. It will be things about how does audit and risk work? How does financial governance work, etc. We also run sessions for staff governors. So members of staff who are on governing bodies, which is very common in the UK. So we run sessions for those. And we also run sessions for student governors. So um, on every board in the UK, there is normally one or two student representatives. We run sessions for them as well. And these are training sessions that universities normally buy places on as part of um, ensuring that they that their governors are well are well trained. And then beyond that, uh, we as an organization do a lot to share and collate 
best practice and share that among institutions as resources or through conferences. Um, and then we also have an important question about how do you prepare people for governance? And that means how through the other leadership programmes that we run. Um, so um, Alison has mentioned our top management programme, which is for aspiring vice chancellors. Then we talk about preparing for governance in programmes like that. So what does it mean to work with your governing body? How might you navigate challenges such as um, as and give different examples. So we try to embed it at both the uh, leadership capacity development level, as well as then training governors um, on, a, on a cyclical basis. And that's because I mentioned earlier, governors in the UK, um, about half of whom are independently um, nominated or appointed to governing bodies from outside of higher education. And they have terms of office for normally around three to four years. So that means in any one year, um, there is always a, a set of new governors or there's quite a lot of change. So the ongoing need for training and development is, is quite strong as well. So it's a number of ways, training of individuals, training people to be prepared for governance and helping them think about that early on in their careers and also sharing practice and resources. And it's our organisation that plays the leading role in that in the UK. Thank you very much, uh, Vicky. And uh, uh, so next question is, how universities engage with employers and how they measure graduate outcomes? A big one. It is a big one. It's that a is a big one. I'm looking at the one about do we need to move to entirely private education, which I would like to answer actually at some stage, Jamilia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, yeah. how, how yeah. do universities engage with employers? Well, I have to say, you know, this is the perennial problem and a challenge in the UK as much as it is in Uzbekistan or Ukraine where we're working and other countries where we're working. Employer engagement is a huge challenge. It's managed locally by the institutions. Um, however, um, this, we've had various systems in the UK where um, authorities have created um, what the, we call them LEPs at the moment, which is local employer partnerships, where universities get together with local employers in the region to look at economic growth, regional development, what are the needs of employers within the, within the region of the university. So that's a system that we have in place. Um, we also have the concept of universities as anchor institutions, which is taking the responsibility in terms of civic engagement, that means setting up strong relationships with um, both local public and private sector providers within their, in their region or within their city. So that's working with the health service, it's working with social services, it's working with the fire service, working with the police to address whatever the specific issues are at the local level. So there are two reasons for you know, employer engagement. One is the social contribution the other is the economic contribution to skills development. Uh, universities set up teams. Um, they will usually have a pro vice chancellor for external engagement and, um, and they will lead um, people across the institution using a matrix structure within the university to take that work forward. Um, was that the whole question? I, I think it yeah, was. Yeah. And, then, and, and did you uh, ask about measures of some? Did you ask, was there yeah. a question about measurement? Yes, there was a question about how do you measure graduate outcomes? Oh, how do you measure graduate outcomes? Um, that's a very technical question. We do have a process and a system for doing it, but I'm afraid I couldn't, I couldn't answer that articulately at the moment. Vicky, can you help on this one? I'll give it a bit of a go. Yeah. <laughs> it, the, the main, I think, theme of this is the powers and perils of data. Mm. So um, how to measure graduate outcomes is really difficult. And as Alison said earlier, we are in the middle of an experiment in the UK, moving from 
how you understand the value of graduates um, to society. So for a long time now, we have measured graduate outcomes in terms of how, what's the job classification that they go on to achieve? So do they get into what might be described as graduate level employment? What do they go on to do? And we've tended to focus on the types of jobs that people go, go into after graduating as one key measure. And we have lots of benchmarked data about that. So institutions for themselves can begin to think about are we delivering for our students as well as we might be compared to our comparator group? And that's been one way of looking at it. And that's measured sometimes um, six months and then 18 months after graduation. So there's, it allows some time for students to move into the labour market. But there has been this focus, as we've both described today, around a better a, a, a different sense of what is the value of higher education. And that is beginning to be looked at, not just in terms of the type of jobs that people move into, but what are the earnings that they get for that type of job as being a sort of proxy for social mobility. So the more money, the more power um, that one has through your earnings enables you to do different things in your life. And that's challenging because uh, we, as Alison was describing, some very important jobs, often in the public sector in the UK, are not highly paid. Teachers, nurses, care workers, not highly paid, but eminently important to the success of our society. Um, however, uh, lawyers, bankers, Others obviously achieve high degrees of funding um, of salary, um, but it's not to say that the value of their degree is potentially any better than someone who goes on to become a nurse or a doctor. So we have, I think, an existential question that we are grappling still with in the UK is how do we want to measure that value? Um, but certainly data is a key component of that and how you might have a, a body or a system of capturing and tracking what students go on to do beyond higher education has, has probably got to feature in that somehow and it enables governing bodies to provide some sort of comparison and enable them to judge what success looks like for them. Okay, thank you very much, Vicky. And um, there is a question around how our admission related needs and requirements are defined. Can you? Can you oh, so yeah. How do you determine admission related needs requirements and demand for different graduates? Mm. Um, okay, I think this again operates on a number of levels. Um, and our new regulator, the Office for Students, is particularly interested in access to higher education across all student groups, um, from the most economically deprived students through to the ones who are most economically supported in their family and their lifestyle. So the Office for Students has um, a subdivision which looks at and requ which requires institutions to provide widening access and participation plans and that forces the institution to say how they will um, increase their numbers of students who are from um, lower social classes, uh, more economically deprived classes, black and ethnic minority groups, um, disabled students, so that all of those who can benefit from higher education can have access to it. So that sets, and, and universities have to draw up their own plans, submit them back to the regulator, who is very, very tough on these plans, very, very demanding of these plans. And then it's up to the institution to deliver on the targets and the plan that they've created for themselves. And this is where it becomes run at the local level and universities will do a lot of different work according to their own particular context or circumstances. It could be anything from working, working with schools to support um, the development of what we call the pipeline into the institution to give school children who might never have thought of going university 
confidence and understanding. Universities run summer camps. Well, when we could actually get into universities to do that sort of thing. But I think the other thing that I've noticed in the last decade, though, is the professionalization of the admissions role in universities. In fact, there is a, a you know, a, a professional body for university admissions staff, um, which is all about sharing, developing good practice. Um, I think they've even developed um, a certificate or some kind of recognition qualification for admissions staff to professionalize service. I don't know if you'd like to add anything to that, Vicky. Yeah, just from a practical perspective, really, I think it's worth remembering that admissions um, for UK institutions is entirely a matter of autonomy, again, so it is up to individual courses, um, individual institutions to make um, the right admissions to their courses. And they normally do that by looking at it um, by course level and what are the entry requirements for that course. And that will also be driven by the needs of the professional um, body, if there is one. So, for example, if it's a law course, then the Law Standards Authority will have some um, guidance on what are the minimum standards you should be um, expecting of students who are going into studying law, etc. And that replicates in other subjects. So it does vary by course, but it is up to the institution to get that right. And then once those um, students are admitted, it's then up to the institution as well to do everything they can to make sure that that student succeeds. Um, so I would say it does vary considerably. Some institutions set overall entrance exams um, or tests for if not all of their provision, then some of it. Many don't. Many don't require um, actual grades. They might uh, admit a student based on prior experience or particularly if they're at a later stage of their life, if they're, um, if they're not a young person. Uh, so it does vary considerably, um, but it's always about trying to set requirements, which mean that students have a good chance of success on the course and to go into um, the intended uh, jobs that, that, that flow from it. Vicky, do you think we ought to remember you mention UCAS? Yeah, that's a good point. So in, in the UK, we have a service for institutions, which is called UCAS, the University and Colleges Admissions Service. And this uh, organisation provides a effectively a service to institutions to manage the admissions process in that it advertises the places that are available and the requirements and students apply to un universities through UCAS. So very few students apply directly to an institution. They apply through UCAS, which has um, uh, a very good website, very good portals, um, and it provides the ability for students to go to one place to look at what's on offer and to then maybe talk to the institutions if they want to, but they make generally a single application to UCAS uh, with a number of choices um, of institution or course on it. And then UCAS works and processes that application and does the, uh, the behind the scenes work so that it's not too complicated for students. So the process overall has three key players, doesn't it, Vicky? So there's the UCAS service, how students apply to go to university, the regulator, which makes demands on universities to make sure that admissions are fair, equal and open to anybody who would benefit from it. And then you have institutional arrangements, um, which contextualise all of that and then help people through UCAS to find the right course for themselves. And we'll also look at contextual information if people aren't a typical student. So that's, oh, that's the summary. Thank you. And um, uh, here is a reminder about the question uh, around private education institutions and uh, do we need to move to entirely to private? Yes, I thought this was a very interesting question. Um, 
asking about the place of private educational institutions in increasing the efficiency of management in the field of education as a whole. Do we need to move entirely to private education? So this is another um, major change in the UK or the English higher education system, whereby a change in legislation opened up the higher education marketplace to private providers. And I think what was very interesting about the debate around this whole issue led to some clarity um, about the questions that we need to think about. And so the question is, is higher education a public good, a public benefit, which the country should invest in because it produces skilled graduates and contributes to the well-being of society and individuals? Or is it a private benefit, one where the student who goes to university will get a, a, a higher salary and personal benefit from having that university degree? And if that was a clear-cut answer, that would help in the decision regarding a totally public or a totally private sector approach to higher education. However, um, like most things in life, the world as is higher education, full of shades of grey. And of course, there is both public and private benefit from individuals having a university or a higher education. And so whilst we have opened up higher education to private sector providers, we still have very much a publicly funded higher education system. I think the question of does this improve efficiency? I think I, I can't quote you um, any particular evidence, but I have, having worked in higher education for 30 years now, I have seen how universities have become more efficient through competition. So if you have somebody competing for your students and you have to give your students um, the highest quality experience possible through high quality staff, high quality accommodation, high quality equipment, high quality materials, which have to be paid for, um, it's amazing how much slack in the system you can find to cut back on in terms of unnecessary bureaucracy. And the biggest thing we see is the streamlining of the administration systems, greater efficiencies in those to invest more in academic staff, to invest more in building, to invest more in teaching facilities for the students. So it's the mixed economy is what we see here. And I do feel the mixed economy has improved the efficiency generally of higher education institutions. The choice of whether it's a totally private sector provision or not is very much a policy choice for your country. All I would say from my personal experience is private sector doesn't always mean best customer experience. Yes, I was just going to add, I don't think we have any evidence at all that private institutions or private higher education goes on to deliver better outcomes for students or society. Nope. It, but then we are early in our days about having a more mixed economy um, between private and public institutions. But certainly there is no evidence yet that that in itself makes a difference. Thank you very much, Alison and Vicky. Uh, there is one question, which is uh, uh, the question that was raised uh, at our policy dialogue meeting a couple of weeks ago when we spoke about women and girls' empowerment in higher education. And colleagues from UK universities mentioned us in a SWAN program. And taking this opportunity, I would like to ask you to, just to explain in a few words what this program is about and whether uh, women academics from Uzbekistan can join this network. Okay, I, I think I'll take this one um, for Vicky. Um, so Athena Swan is a gender equality program which has been in existence now since about 2005. Its origins came from women who were in STEM subjects in the science community, 
who felt very frustrated by the rigidity of working life and how it was stopping them from progressing their careers. And um, I worked at the same funder and regulator as Vicky did then. And the funder identified this was a problem. It was a barrier to women progressing in the sciences. And so we gave it some small funding and Athena SWAN was created. So SWAN stands for the Science Women's Academic Network. So it was very much a bottom-up initiative. This became a charter. And what we mean by that is institutions sign up for the Athena SWAN Charter. They do their own self-assessment of the barriers to women's progression. They do this through surveys, through staff focus groups, through examination of their policies, looking at data in relation to applications, female success rate, promotions, female success rates, and so on and so forth. So it's a highly evidence-based, data-based, and qualitative-based approach to developing an action plan for change. Now, what distinguishes Athena Swan from women's development programs is is that it is designed to specifically deal with the structural barriers to women's advancement in institutions. Becoming very simple things about, you know, the nine till five, the eight o'clock in the morning till six o'clock at, at the end of the day, working day. It can be things as simply as, you know, meetings don't start till nine or 10 o'clock because it's the women who take the children to school and pick them up. So it, it looks at structural issues, it looks at flexibility, it looks at the science labs and how they work. Whatever the issues are for that institution will be in the action plan. Now the action plan can attract, uh, uh, and these, these action plans are then peer reviewed. And if they're passed, then the institution gets a bronze award. The next level is a silver award and the next level is the gold award. And a really good example of a gold award is the physics department at Cambridge University, who identified that women undergraduates um, were dropping out and were significantly less successful than boy undergraduates. So they did some small things, actually. They made sure that um, they moved from an individual based approach to team based approach uh, studies in the first year. They made sure that women undergraduates were only taught by women physics lecturers in their first year. And they did a third thing, which escapes me now. Um, but those three things put together actually changed the retention rates dramatically. And the physics department at Cambridge is still an Athena, Athena gold um, because they're constantly looking at and improving their approaches to supporting women in the workplace. So Athena Swan is now taken up in, um, is operating in America with the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, in Australia with the AAAS, which is the Australian Academy of Science, um, the Republic of Ireland, Canada, India is developing their Athena Swan Charter, Japan's interested, so it truly is becoming a global phenomenon. And the reason for this is, of all of the gender equality charters and movements, Athena Swan, along with one other, which is based on the Athena Swan methodology, are the only two proven to have real impact and bring about significant change. And we also know that women academics who are looking to move jobs will choose an Athena Swan department over any other, anything else that's offered in terms of attracting them to employment because they know if that department or that university has Athena Swan, all of the other small things that universities offers to support women will already be in place and sorted. There will be flexible working arrangements. So, and, and it also um, improves quality and so on and so forth. So Athena Swan is, a, is now a global charter. If you wanted to have Athena Swan in Uzbekistan, it would need to be designed for your context and that's a conversation we'd be very willing to have with you because um, we, we do it in other countries. Oh, I forgot New Zealand is also now signing up to this and we contextualize it. Um, and then you could run your own Athena Swan, but perhaps that's a conversation to be had outside of here.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Alison. There is a further question about uh, around, um, you know, graduates and uh, the question is, do universities trace their graduates or are they not interested in how their students do once they graduate, <laughs> graduate from the university? Vicky, you touched on this a bit earlier, didn't you, in terms yeah, of graduate yeah. outcomes and, anything, and, and the Leo anything data? Anything to add? Yeah, so there's two really key things. I would say that universities are really um, interested in what their graduates go on to do for two main reasons. So the first is um, there is um, they do need the data. They do need to know in order to uh, understand uh, the impact that they are making. So, as I said before, uh, we collect data nationally about what graduates go on to do. There are some surveys that happen and that happens um, through a data body um, and they effectively have permission from the universities to follow up with, with graduates after a agreed um, period of time to find out what they're doing, what sorts of jobs they're, they're, they are in. So the data is, is really important because then that data is used as part of the regulatory and governance landscape. But the other key reason institutions uh, do want to follow up with their graduates is because actually um, the concept of alumni relations is really powerful in higher education. So understanding who your, um, your key graduates are and what they have gone on to achieve means that you might have links into other industries. Um, you might have people who have really powerful stories to tell about the difference that higher education has made to them. They might be speakers, they might be contributors to things um, that go on in the university. And later down the line, they might be philanthropists, they might give money, uh, to, they might fund initiatives, they might be keen to uh, support higher education and the power that that can play within society. So there are reasons why universities want to stay in touch with their graduates. Um, and it's about the data landscape, yes, but it's also about cultivating um, a community of people who can be drawn on both to provide opportunities for current students, but also to provide opportunity for the university. And it's a really a growing movement within the UK um, of, of that happening. Thank you very much, Vicky. And the final comment that we can probably deal with is around um, um, um, quality can be in increased if supply of education satisfies the demand. So the school in theory not always work. Um, moreover, we need to improve our higher education institutions in triplex helix development cycle. Uh, can you comment on this? Um. I'm not sure if I understand the schooling theory section onwards, but in terms of quality can be increased if supply of education satisfies the demand. This is not always or not everywhere here in Uzbekistan. Um, so that's an interesting statement. Of course, uh, quality may not be increased just because education satisfies the demand. So I might demand education. I might have a jolly, jolly, lovely time in the classroom, um, but it might not be quality education and it might not achieve quality outcomes. So I don't think supply alone of education, satisfying the student alone is enough for quality. And so the tensions we see in the UK are often <laughs> wrapped around the, the discussion around, is the, is the student a customer? Because if it's a customer, then all you're concerned about is satisfying your customer. And, you know, if I'm in a restaurant and my customer wants chalk ice and chips because they're a seven year old, that customer will leave highly delighted because they got their chalk ice and chips. But is that really a healthy diet for a seven year old? No, it's not every day. So I think um, this goes right to the heart of the relationship. It goes right through to governance, it goes right through to teaching, it goes right through to everything. It's that combined role of working in partnership with students, 
to understand what their needs are and how we can best teach them, but also the university having the expertise and the knowledge about many things that the student doesn't even know that they need to know or are available to them. And that's why the idea of partnership, I think, is so important. Um, I'm sorry, I don't think I really understand the second sentence. <laughs> I'll what I mean, it's not always what we yeah. need in practice, what we learn in, oh, so ah, here we are. So uh, Munisa here is saying that um, something about the relevance of your curriculum. And absolutely, that goes to the heart of the employer relationships, the community engagement and relationships, understanding what the needs are. And this is something, I mean, I started working in higher education 30 years ago. It was absolutely the case in higher education then. And I think we have made good inroads to this over, over three decades. Um, and I would imagine that you have a big job to do here and a big job of curriculum review to making sure that it's fit for purpose. And it's never going to stop because the needs externally are always changing. So very good point, Munissa. If that's how you pronounce your name, I'm sorry. Thank you very much, Alison. And I think this is the end of our conversation today. And thank you very much for such an interesting input, uh, Alison and Vicky. And thank you everyone for your active participation mm -hmm. and for your really, really interesting questions. Yes. We agreed with Alison and Vicky that we will have a, another session to follow up on all your comments and suggestions, and we will be waiting for your comments um, uh, around this session and maybe shaping the content of, uh, of a follow-up session with you around uh, university performance and university governance. We are also planning a session on a student engagement and students' journey in higher education institution. And that is uh, going to be in the next three, four weeks, but we will uh, send you the invitation. We are also inviting you uh, on the 18th of March to the presentation of uh, nine projects that have been developed as part of the Change Academy with Advance HE. And those projects are around quality assurance in higher education and graduate outcomes. So we will be uh, sending the invitations to you um, today or tomorrow, and we will be waiting uh, for you to present some outcomes of uh, the Change Academy this year. So uh, once again, many thanks to all of you for being part of this really important conversation and being part of wider British Council program here in Uzbekistan. And thanks again to the Ministry of Higher and Secondary Specialized Education, Higher Education Council, uh, El Yurtamide Foundation and Uzbek Embassy in London and all universities in Uzbekistan for being fantastic partners to work with. And thank you once again, Advance HE, Alison, Vicky, uh, much bigger team that is working on the project in Uzbekistan for excellent collaboration and excellent expertise and experience that you share with us. So thank you everyone and see you soon and happy Navruz. Navruz is coming. So uh, yes. happy Navruz and all the best to all of you. Thank, thank you. you. Happy Navruz. Bye bye. Thank you everybody. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank you for...